Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, I'm going to just have a word of prayer, and then we're going to be in Genesis chapter 11. So I encourage you to turn there in your uh, Bibles or your handheld devices. Father, I do love you. Father, help me to love you more. I praise you and I thank you, Father, for your great work in us and through us. Father, for your preparing a place for us at the end of this journey. Thank you so much for the word that you've given to draw us together. Thank you so much for the worship and the time of offering. Thank you, Father, that you have given us to one another to strengthen and confirm our faith. We praise you, Father, and as we transition into this time of the word, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, Lord, teach us something new, expand not only our understanding, but our faith as well. Lord God in heaven, help us to trust on the rock, Christ Jesus. We do praise you and we thank you. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Bless you. I can say that that's my job. Bless you. I'm actually going to start in Genesis chapter 10. I said 11, but I'm going to start in chapter 10 to kind of get us up to where we were. Remember last time we came together, we were talking about the, the sons of Noah and his descendants. And there's this passage, uh, chapter 10, verse 8 through 12, and that's an important background to uh, chapter 11. So beginning in chapter 10, verse 8, Now Cush became the father of Nimrod, he became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like a Nimrod before the Lord. No, it doesn't say that. Okay. Therefore it says, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. That word before is really interesting to do a word study on sometime. Jump with me to Genesis chapter 11 now, beginning in verse 1. And I'm going to read and kind of throw some commentary in here, so please bear with me as I, it feels like I jump back and forth. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they, and then that's why we read Genesis chapter 10, 8 through 12, we would know who the they were that we're talking about. That as they, as Nimrod and his family journeyed east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They say, Come, let us. And this, we find, is in open rebellion to God's command to fill the earth. God's command uh, for mankind to go and be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth, and rather mankind establishes their own kingdom as they prepare bricks and mortar to glorify themselves. Mankind will see, as we read through this, mankind will say this three times and accomplish nothing. God will say it one time and accomplish everything. So they say in verse 3, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us. There's that second. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower. A city establishing their political autonomy. We are no longer under God's authority anymore. We're establishing our own city. We're setting up our own governance. And a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And now they were establishing their own religious freedom. Because they were going to make a, what we call a ziggurat. It's a, it's a pyramid with a flat top. And on the top of that was where they could have their pagan worship all the ways up high for everybody around to see. They were very intentional about what they were doing. Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us, again, there's the third, let us make for ourselves a name. Satan waits patiently for opportunity, doesn't he? He waits so patiently for opportunity. I think that sometimes we think that, that Satan is the only one out to get us. And yet we are sometimes victims to our own demise. 
Because we, we sit and stew and think about touching that apple that God said don't even eat. We think about touching it. So Satan just simply wastes an opportunity as he did with Eve in Genesis 3, 5. As he did with Cain in Genesis 4, 7. He waits for greed and pride to overwhelm us. And that would tempt us to sin, just as Satan himself did. Jesus alone withstood the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. But it says again in verse 4, They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven, and let us make for ourselves a name otherwise. Otherwise. Now their real reason is about to be revealed. They are to be betrayed by their own false hopes and find that it is only sin that, that they will find there. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the whole face of the earth. Otherwise. It, it sounds like they have a pretty good plan there, doesn't it? Like, like they've got this whole thing worked out. Look, we can just go, and, and when, you, when it says that, that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, that word before actually means in the face of. So he didn't just stand before God. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, in the face of God, almost in defiance of God. And then this is, this is the spirit in which they traveled east to Shinar, into what we was now called, or what later became Persia, which later became Iran and Iraq, that we shall go there, and we'll build a city for ourselves. We'll make up our own laws. We'll govern ourselves. We got this all worked out. We'll have religious freedom. We will. We won't fail where Cain failed. We'll have our own established religion. We'll do all that we want. They've got everything figured out before they even get there, don't they? And I like John Phillips. I I, I like when people can make things simple. Are you simple like me? I, <laughs> I like when things people make things simple. John Phillips simply writes this in in reference to these first four verses. They reckoned without God. They made all these plans and schemes and thoughts, and they never thought about what God might think about that, what God might do about that. And so as the narrative continues in verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people. They are one people. They are united in intention. In this case, it was for selfishness and rebellion. And already we're back to pre-flood in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, where the thoughts of men were continually on evil. We're already right back there within just a few short generations. Verse 6 again, the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. They could have done anything, and this is what they chose to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Verse 7, come let us. Now God speaks, doesn't he? Three times man has proclaimed this over himself and accomplished nothing. God is about to say it one time and accomplish everything. Come let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not, be, so they will not understand one another's speech. In verse 4, what was the otherwise followed by? Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Remember that. We just read that. And then in verse 8, what is it meant by? So the Lord scattered them abroad. From there over the face of the whole earth. And they stopped building the city. The Lord reigns over the affairs of creation. Does he not? The Lord reigns over the affairs of creation. We can, we can close his book. We can stop praying. We can turn our faces away as we drive past churches and as we drive us in, but it does not stop the sovereignty of God. He will not be excluded from his creation. Their rebellion, as we will find, as was Adam and Eve's, as is ours, is met with grace and not destruction. The Lord doesn't choose to come down and smite them with a heavy smoting. He doesn't wipe them out. But in this, he gives it grace. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Verse 9, therefore its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the whole face of the earth. 
It's an interesting passage, isn't it? I mean, there's just so much going on. We see the, the, the effects of the fall. We, we've studied this over the past few weeks and, and months. We've seen the effects of the fall and how it just corrupted all of mankind. All of flesh was corrupted. Their hearts were continually on evil. And then the flood comes and, and washes it away. God's grace and mercy, he provides for one, one family who alone is found faithful because Noah walked with God. And here we are at Nimrod, just fourth down the line from Noah. Just a couple generations from Noah. And already their hearts are again bent towards sin. Already they are in defiance. They are before the Lord in their defiance. Saying, no, you know, I know that what God said, but I'm going to build the city anyways. I know that God has prescribed a worship of him and how we should approach him. I've got my own plans, things that are more convenient or things that I like better. And they tried to shut God out of that city. How do you shut God out of the city when he reigns over the city? <laughs> you going to lock a door on God? I don't think so. And so God comes down into this city and he pronounces judgment. He, he confuses their language and scatters them abroad. And his initial intention is accomplished anyways, isn't it? Despite all that we do, we make these plans, we shoot to and fro, and we forget to reckon on God. It's interesting. When God says no. When God says no. You see, there's this problem. There's this problem that, that they had in Babel and in all of Nimrod's kingdom that God said no. No. God has the prerogative to say that, doesn't he? And it's actually not very difficult to say. You can say, go ahead and say, no. no. No, it's not hard to say. And God alone is sovereign to say this. There are three times when God will say no to us. And in those times, we need to listen. We need to stop speaking, because all that's coming out is Babel anyways, right? God has confused our languages, and, and all that's coming out is Babel, so we need to start listening instead of speaking. The first time, I, I, the first way I find that God says no, at least to me, in my walk, is when God says, not at all. No, not at all, Andy. We're, we're not going there. It's not like I'm in the car and I'm like, this is a great idea, God. Let's go do this. Let's do it really fast right now. And God's sitting in the passenger seat and he's looking at me he's like, are you really sure you want to? That's not one of those situations. This is a situation where I go to the car and I'm ready to do what I want. And as I reach my hand for the door handle, God is already in the driver's seat. And says, no, we're not even going there at all, Andy. Not at all. And this is what we find in the Tower of Babel. God is saying, no, not at all. Not at all. We're, we're not doing this here. Not on my creation. I just destroyed all of life, all of creation. Recreated it. And just four generations, we're doing this again. No, not at all. Not at all, folks. Derek Kidner wrote, The primeval history reaches its fruitless climax as man, conscious of his new abilities, prepares to glorify and fortify himself by collective effort. At the same time, they betray their insecurity as they crowd together, away from the presence of God, to preserve their identity and control their fortune interesting. No, not at all. Not at all, Nimrod. Not at all, Babel. Not at all, selfful, sinfish, selfful, selfish, sinful mankind. Not at all. Defiance is no way for God's creation to live in the face of him, is it? Defiance is no way to do this. Look at, look at the, the verses just kind of betray things. Look at verse 3 and 4. You could just read through them. And not think of anything, but look at it. It says in verse 3 and 4, Let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They decided to settle instead of spread out like God had commanded them. We'll settle instead of spreading out. They used brick instead of stone. Why is that word stone there unless it's important? They use brick instead of stone because God takes time and he builds things on the rock, Christ Jesus. And we try to hurry up and make bricks, don't we? We try to hurry up and, and take the clay and bake them and form them and bake them and make what we want and build up quick edifices instead of taking time and letting God build this house. 
But they decide, no, no, it's going to be our way and it's going to be right now. And so they make bricks instead of stone. They use tar instead of mortar. They use this sticky bitum uh, that, that was just nasty black goo to work with instead of building solidly like God would want them to. They want to make a city, their city, instead of building God's kingdom. They wanted to have their own tower instead of coming to worship before the throne of God. They wanted to preserve their name instead of lifting high the name of Jesus Christ. Defiance is no way for God's creation to live, and this is why God comes down sometimes and says, not at all. And do you know that sometimes God will do that right to the church? Have you ever had that happen? Because, boy, we come up with these great plans, don't we? We come up with these great plans that we're going to do this, and, and the community's going to love us, and we're going to do this, and then the community's going to know we're here, and then we're going to do this, and then people are going to want to come and be with us. And, we're gonna, and all of a sudden, if we could just step back and look at it, we're making all these plans about us, and we're not thinking for a moment what God is doing and what God is doing in the lives of the community around us. And, and like John Philip says, we forgot to reckon on God in the whole process. And I have done some things in, in, in my past 30 years of ministry. I have done some things that, that were just on paper, flat out successes. They were like, this is going to be amazing. And from step one, two, and three, there was struggle and stumble all the way. And we had to just stop and say, wait a minute, maybe, maybe God's just not in this. Maybe God's not, in, and that's right in the church. So sometimes God says, not at all. John Salehammer writes, God who saw that their plans would succeed, but that they were plans that would lead, him farther, lead them farther from him and closer to destruction, moved to rescue them from those plans and to return them to the blessings that awaited. Beautiful. Beautiful. God could have destroyed them because of their sin and selfishness. And he said, no, I have a better plan for you, and the blessing is still here. But this is not the path to it, and we're not going this way. How gracious of God, amen? How kind of God to work with us in those times, to slow us down. And we should be listening more than speaking babble. Sometimes God says, not at all. That's the Tower of Babel. That's what it's all about. Sometimes God says, not like that. Not like that. God created Adam and Eve to live with him forever, for eternity. He created this paradise. He placed them in it. And the desire was that they would live forever. But when they took of that fruit, they, they altered the relationship. And now if they took from the fruit of life, they would live forever with God, but they would live forever in sin. And God says, no, no, not like that. I want you to live forever. I'm not taking the tree of life away from you. I'm reserving it for a time when Christ will redeem you. It'll be there at the end. We can read the book of Revelation. We live on this side of the cross. It'll be there. Don't worry. But I'm not going to have you living eternally in sin. But I'm going to provide a way. I'm going to provide a path for you. So, so not quite like that, Adam and Eve. And sometimes he'll do the same thing for us, and we, we rush ahead, and we get way ahead of God in the plans, and we find out, oh, God might do something, and, and all of a sudden, we're, man, we're full throttle. And we're like, come on, God, come on, hurry up, come on. And God's like, no, no, not like that. Not like that. I want this done according to my will and my ways and in my time. Slow down. Slow down. And then there are times, those final times, when God just says, not yet. Not yet. That is a beautiful plan. I, I can just picture God saying this. That's a beautiful plan. I love it. I love it. Just not yet. I've got a few more things to accomplish. And then I'm going to just blow out your doors with blessing, right? We're going to read Jeremiah 29 in just a little bit, and you're going to see that. Not yet. You're going to have it, but just not yet. Slow down. This, I believe, is where we are most of the time. I think that we are praying people. I think that we, we try to live by the word of God. I think we try to hear by his word. And we're living in the not yet. And I think that this is where we do a lot of growing. I remember a, a, a story that I heard. I actually heard this a little while ago. 
And uh, I went to a training last week. I was out in Elmira, New York, and I was uh, at a training for work. And uh, I'm going to give you the PG version of the story because it's not. If you if you YouTube it, please don't. Remember, I'm not sharing it the way it's on YouTube. Okay. But it's called Five Wet Monkeys. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. Five Wet Monkeys. And they did an experiment. What they did was they took uh, five monkeys and they put them in the room. And then they had this pole coming out with a banana hanging on it and little steps. And the minute the first monkey walked up to it and started going up the steps, they took out a, like a fire hose and they just blasted all the monkeys with the fire hose. And they all scattered and hid. And then the fire hose was turned off. And then a little bit later on, the brave monkey would go back over again and he'd start going up those stairs to get that banana, right? Because he wants the banana. And the fire hose would come on again and it would blast all five of them, just dousing these monkeys. And then the fire hose would go off. What do you think would happen the third time that that monkey went to the, to the banana? The other four monkeys beat him up, didn't they? <laughs> like, don't you touch that banana. We know what happens. Don't touch that banana. <clears throat> so five wet monkeys, anytime any of them went to them. And then they took one of the monkeys out and replaced it with a new monkey. Well, the new monkey doesn't know anything, does he? So the new monkey looks around and he sees these guys like hanging out doing nothing and there's this free banana. Nobody's taking the banana. So he starts walking over and he starts going up the steps with the banana. What do you think the other four monkeys did? Jumped on they jumped on him. They beat him up. <laughs> don't, don't even go there. And one by one, they began to replace the monkeys and put a new one in. And one by one, until eventually it was all new monkeys. They had taken the banana out of the room. There was no water hose. But as soon as any one of them went to those stairs, the other monkeys would beat them up. And we're in this broken mindset. We're in this broken mindset because we keep thinking the same things. We keep thinking the same thoughts. Some, in the church, we recognize it when we say it this. It's the way we've always done it. Outside in the world, we call it other things. But there's this broken mindset. And God says, no, not like that. Sometimes not at all. Sometimes not yet, but this is where God will work with us. The Holy Spirit will work within us to effect a progressive change in us. A change in the things that we hope for. A change in the things that we desire. A change in the things that we request. The Holy Spirit will begin to do this. And we will grow toward stop asking questions that we know that we'll get a no to. We just don't desire those things anymore. Jesus says... Ask in my name, right? Remember that Jesus says, ask in my name, whatever you ask my name, I'll give it, right? Did you ever really try that and ask for something stupid? <laughs> right? Jesus, I, I want this and this and this, and there's Jesus going, no, my name wouldn't ask for that. And then we wonder why he wouldn't give it to us. Well, God, I asked for it in your name. Stop. We, we begin this progressive change as the Holy Spirit works in us and within us to change those hopes, desires, and wants so that our hopes, desires, and wants are actually led by the Spirit of God so that our hopes, desires, and wants match Jesus' hopes, desires, and wants. And then when we ask those things in His name, He freely gives them to us. God, I want a big screen TV. I am asking in Jesus' name that I receive a big screen TV today. And Jesus is like, what are you going to do with that big screen TV? Because I, I wouldn't, Jesus is like, I wouldn't ask for a big screen TV. I have zero need for a big screen TV. And Jesus is not obligated to answer that. But if we say, Jesus, I just want to see you move in my family's life. Jesus, would you, would you touch my wife? Would you touch my children? Would you touch my spouse? Jesus, would you just do something? That's something Jesus would want, isn't it? And now all of a sudden, our hopes, desires, and wants are lining up with his hopes, desires, and wants. And instead of continuing to ask for questions that we know we're going to get a no to, we learn to start asking questions that we'll get a yes to. Amen? And so that brings us to when God says yes. The times in our lives when God says yes. And these are matters first of the matters of the will. Matters of the will. His will, not our will. His will, not our will. John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. Jesus himself, in all four of the Gospels, if you're not sure if this is important, 
It shows up in all four of the Gospels. Jesus says to the Father, not my will, but your will. Not my will, Father, but your will. And so we need to get to those questions of the will. Lord God in heaven, help me to see what you're doing in this world. I want to see your will revealed. Those are the kinds of prayers that God would answer. Not how can I set up a city and a tower for myself? How can I build my own kingdom? How can I do those things? But Father in heaven, show me your will. Show me your will, whether it's in your word or through the counsel of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Show me your will. God will answer those things. He'll say yes, and I'll pour, he'll pour it out on you. Amen? Seek those things first. Second, a thing that God says uh, yes to is wants. Wants. God says yes to his wants, not necessarily our wants. And do we know what the wants of God are? Because they're in Scripture. They're right in here. If we're not sure where they are, go ahead and read them. I would encourage you to go home and read the book of Nehemiah. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about today as far as uh, pulling verse out. Go home and read the book of Nehemiah. I was reading the book of Nehemiah once. You know what the overarching theme of Nehemiah is? And everybody says, oh, I've read, well, maybe not everybody, but some say, oh, I've read Nehemiah. It's about building the wall. Yeah, it's about rebuilding Jerusalem. It has nothing to do with it. It's just the vehicle that God uses to glorify his name. Because over and over and over again in the book of Nehemiah, I started writing it down, I think I stopped at like 9 or 10. So that my name, God would say that over and over, so that my name, so that my name, so the nations will know my name, so that my people will know my name. God's first desire, his first want, is that he would be known by us. That we would slow our lives down, that we would stop trying to build cities for ourselves, and that we would look forward, look into his kingdom that we would desire to know Him, that we would honor Him. You know one of the easiest ways to honor God is? Just pray to Him. Just talk to Him. Lord, of all the voices that are out there, of all the, the media blitz on social media, of all the news that's going on, of all the things that are going on, I want to listen first to you, God. I want to honor you. What would you do in my life? What do you want for my life? Another way that we can uh, see God's wants is that he wants to be served. And this is not like a menial serving. This is a coming to the Lord's table serving. T taking time and fellowshipping with him. Supping with him. God wants to be served. He calls pastors ministers of his word. Think about that. If none of you guys showed up this morning, if, if nobody was listening to this on social media or YouTube or whatever, I would still be here serving his word. Now, it might look funny because <laughs> I'd be jumping around to an empty room, but, but the spirit of God is here and I'm here to serve his word and his word deserves to be read. It deserves to be spoken out over all of creation. And, and another want, these are just ones that I wrote very quickly, but another want of God is to be loved as our God. Do you love God like he's your God? Do you love God like the Israelites were called to love him? I, I look at Exodus chapter 20, and we think of these as the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments. Strong stuff. And we're going to look at these in, in, a, in a few weeks. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. This is how he starts it. Guys, I brought you out of that sin. I brought you out of that junk. I brought you out of that illness, whatever it is. I brought you out of that because I love you. And I want you to love me like your God. This is a major, major theme throughout the Old Testament. That we would be called the people of God and that we would call on him as our God. God says yes to matters of his will. God says yes to matters of his heart. And finally, God says yes to matters of his ways. And that's his timing. Let me share with you a verse that I think so many of us love. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. Everybody knows this, right, don't we? For I know the plans that I have for you. 
You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I'm going to read it for you. We love this verse, this, this section, Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Right? We know this, right? Did you know the verse that comes right before it? Verse 10 comes right before verse 11. In case you haven't done the math. Verse 10 does come before 11. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed. When 70 years has been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a, a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you. I have a plan for you. It's just not yet. It's just not yet. We need to learn to embrace that, that there's a, there's a measure of his ways, his timing in the blessing, and we need to receive that. So when, when I say, Lord, I'm, I am praying, I'm just going to throw it out here, Lord, I'm praying for a healing. I'm, pray, I'm praying for a healing. And I'm asking in Jesus' name. I believe that Jesus would want me healed, don't you? I believe that Jesus would want me healed. He created me to live a full and blessed life. But it just might not be today. But it is according to his will, and it is according to his time, and I can now rest in that. I can rest in that and know and rest assured that he will say yes. I want to close this way. If you will turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. It's funny, of all the verses that I didn't mark was the one I'm going to close with. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, another version of this occurs in Luke. It's the Lord's Prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. I believe that as we learn to pray the Scripture as the Lord prayed, that I believe that we'll begin to let the Holy Spirit do that effectual work within us and progressively change the way that we ask for things, progressively change the type of things that we're asking for, and that, that we'll stop asking those things that we know we're going to get an answer to. God in heaven, would you please, Lord, some way work it out that I get a Jim Dandy Sunday for lunch. You don't really need a Jim Dandy Sunday for lunch, Andy. That's going to be a no. <laughs> you know? But Father in heaven, would you just provide for this day all that I need? That's going to be a yes, isn't it? So let's close with this. You can kind of follow along with me. I'm, I'm probably going to get a little excited and do see where the Spirit takes me, but think about if our prayers look more like this. This is Jesus praying red letter stuff. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be your name. Our Father who is in heaven, our Father who is far above all of the sin and junk and corruption of this world, who is untouched by the stain of sin, who is untouched by the fall, our Father who is in heaven right now preparing a place for you and I. Preparing it for us, for you and I, hallowed, make holy your name. Father in heaven, make your name holy in my life. Make me pause when I hear the name of Jesus. Make my heart flutter when I hear the name of Jesus. Let me have this quiet reverence when I hear someone refer to the Lord God Almighty. Let me pause in expectation when someone mentions the Holy Spirit because I know he's going to show up and do something. Our Father who is heaven, hallowed be your name. And it is to that, Father, that we ask that your kingdom come. Your kingdom, Father, not my kingdom. My kingdom is made of bricks and, and tar and pitch and it's just, it's decaying and falling apart as much as my unsaved soul is. But I've been saved, I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I want his kingdom not just in my physical life, but I want it all around me. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen. 
Father, help me to live according to your word, according to your standard. Your will be done on earth. This is a prayer for right now, not just for the heavenlies. On earth as it is in heaven. What are they doing in heaven right now? They're worshiping God, aren't they? They are exalting Jesus Christ. They are rejoicing over every soul that is saved that comes into the kingdom. May that happen in my life on this earth every day. Every day may I wake up and just rejoice in the Lord God Almighty. May I sing praises to Him. May I rejoice when people have accepted Him as their personal Savior on this earth, just like they are in heaven. We can worship God. Can you imagine that? We can worship God just like they are in heaven, right here on earth. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, and, and we know that the true man of the true bread is Jesus Christ. Yeah. That we can survive on him and him alone. But also, Father, those, those physical needs that I have, Lord God in heaven, just food and sustenance. Lord, I don't trust my boss. Ginny, my boss is a great guy. <laughs> don't let that get back to him. But I don't trust my boss for my next meal. I trust my Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our sins. <laughs> it's a hard one to pray. You've got to be ready. Here. You've got to be bold about this. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. Do you understand the power of what's, what's going on there when you pray that? Lord, forgive me. This is what he's saying. This is Jesus, red letter stuff. Forgive me in direct proportion to how I forgive others. It's a little scary to say that prayer now, isn't it? Forgive me in direct proportion to how I forgive others. So that is really quickly followed by, and Lord, teach me how to forgive right now. <laughs> teach me how to be gracious right now. Teach me how to be merciful right now. And I'm thankful that my forgiveness is not hinged on my ability to forgive others. It's, it's based on God's ability to forgive through Jesus Christ. But, oof, that's a heavy one here to pray, isn't it? Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have done against us. And lead us not into temptation. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that is all sorts of evil. That is the evil that is in the world out there that is trying to get in and destroy us. That is the evil that is within us, the old sin of Adam, that is trying to manifest itself out. And we say, no, I'm redeemed. I am in the seed of Jesus Christ now. I am redeemed. And so, Father in heaven, help me not to be tempted, not to be led astray, even from the evil that would be residing, residing within me. But help me, Father. Lead me. Lead me. And in closing, for yours is the kingdom. What was Nimrod trying to build? His own kingdom, wasn't he? I want to get to the point where my life is nothing about me. Right? I want to get to the point where my life is nothing about me, but what my amazing God has done in me, and for me, and through me. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And the body said, Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would do this effectual change within us. Father, it's hard to hear that word no sometimes. Sometimes we just, we get bent on it and we think that we know what's best, that we want what we want, we want it now in the way that we want it. But I want my life to be less about me. I want you to be the hero of my story. And so Father in heaven, I pray that you would Use the Holy Spirit. I make myself available to the working of the Holy Spirit in my life. That you would use the Holy Spirit to change my wants and my wills and my way. Lord, that it would line up with you. That it would line up with your Son, Jesus Christ. That I would begin to ask things that you say yes to. And even that you would say yes right now to. Father in heaven, those kinds of things. are Praying for my marriage. Praying for my spouse. 
praying for my children, praying for my church. Lord, show yourself up strong in those areas. As, as Brother Jim says, show up and show off, God. Let them know that you are God Almighty. I praise you for your word, Lord. I thank you for that. Lord, let it be a, just a blessing to our heart to receive it today. Let us go out and share it with someone else and to encourage them as much as we've been encouraged. And we praise you. And we thank you. We worship you. We adore you. We love you as our God and Savior. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Worship team, come.